And one of the big things was that I was afraid to go to sleep because I was afraid I was going to die in my sleep. So I told this whole story and um, an electrophysiologist uh, who puts in ICDs uh, stood up afterwards and she said, it's very interesting that you said you were afraid to sleep um, after you got your ICD and went home because as a doctor, when I put in an ICD in a patient, I sleep better because now I know they're safe. What's up there everyone, welcome here to another episode on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. My name is Yelis Fass and I am your host and as well a fellow cardiac arrest survivor. Here on the podcast I chat with other survivors uh, to hopefully bring you, if you are a cardiac arrest survivor as well, support and possibly some pieces of tips and lessons that you can use on um, on this wild journey. In this episode, I had the pleasure of welcoming Mike Papale, the founder of In A Heartbeat. Now, in the conversation, we, we talk much more in depth about why he founded the foundation and what it is about. But in short, In A Heartbeat is a, a foundation dedicated to sudden cardiac arrest awareness, research and donations of AEDs. So far, over 200 AEDs have been donated through his foundation to schools, police departments, libraries, etc. $305,000 has been raised for cardiac disease research. Over 3,000 people have been trained in CPR, which is just amazing. And uh, over 4,000 people have had their hearts screened. Um, all thanks to the foundation that Mike has uh, founded. Now, as always, you know, to find uh, anything that meant that we talked about, anything that was mentioned in this uh, conversation, such as the foundation in a heartbeat, and as well uh, the podcast that Mike hosts, which is um, a big heart, uh, where he talks about living with heart disease. Do check out the show notes which you can find, as always, in the description of this episode, or as well, um, if you can't find them there, by going directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Mike. But having said that, I do sincerely hope that you will find uh, support and value here in this episode with Heart Warrior Mike Papale. Mike, a uh, warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's uh, it's a true pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. So I read on your website uh, from uh, a big heart. Uh, oh no, sorry, in a heartbeat foundation, which we're actually going to talk about more uh, down the line. But I read that you had a cardiac arrest at the age of seventeen, which is uh, that's quite young. Can you? just share a bit about that, uh, that experience? Like, yeah, 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 definitely. So I guess I'll start by saying like leading up to my sudden cardiac arrest, I was like a super healthy guy. Like I, I didn't know or ever, I never thought, and my parents never thought that me being like a young teenager athlete, um, you know, I always went and had a physical. So I saw my doctor every year. So we never really suspected that, you know, I could have something wrong with my heart. Um, so that's just kind of like the backstory. So I never had like signs or symptoms. There was nothing really that like made anybody think that I could go into some cardiac arrest one day, which we know now doesn't happen. Um, there isn't always signs and symptoms, but so the day of my sudden cardiac arrest, uh, was August 24th, 2006. So <laughs> it's about to be a 17 year uh, anniversary. Wow. Um, and I woke up that morning, my brother and I, we went and did a basketball workout at like six o'clock in the morning and it was a totally fine totally normal um nothing really stood out i can still remember like being there that day working out and i felt fine um so we worked out for like two hours and then after the workout ended we went to our local parks and recreation center where our father was actually um hosting his annual basketball camp and we were both camp counselors so I walked in at like 8.15 in the morning and I said hi to my dad and I changed uh, my shirt, ordered lunch, and I don't remember anything else that happened that day. So 
you know, all of my stories from that day are all just uh, kind of based on what the people that were there and witnessed it told me. So at 1030, so two hours after, we had just come inside with the kids and I was sitting on the bleachers and my best friend was sitting next to me and my brother was uh, there on the court refereeing. And I just kind of like fell forward and went into sudden cardiac arrest. So um, as you know, we did both know it's crucial that you receive immediate CPR and the quick yeah. shot from the defibrillator to have a high survival chance. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, in my situation, there was no CPR administered right away. Um, I was agonal gasping and there was no, no defibrillator in the building. Um, so I got really lucky because somebody called 911. Uh, there was a volunteer EMT next door. He got the call on his pager. He recognized the address, came over and gave me really high quality CPR for a significant period of time until the ambulance showed up. And then they used the defibrillator from the ambulance to shock my heart. And they got, you know, a sinus rhythm on site. Um, you know, I don't remember anything, like I said, two hours before and two days after. Um, but, you know, I ended up spending some time in the hospital and, um, you know, figuring out kind of what caused it. But, yeah, that was the day. Um, you know, thankfully, I don't remember it. I always say it's kind of harder on, on the people that witnessed it. But mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Crazy that they didn't even add like um, an AED there. Yeah. And we think back, it definitely is a place that should have had an AED. Um, yeah. And it since has gotten one that has saved somebody, which is really um, cool, of course. Oh. Um, but, you know, in 2006, you know, defibrillators or AED specifically, I don't think weren't quite as prevalent as they are now. Um, they were they were definitely in, in the market, but they were they were more expensive and they, they just weren't as prevalent as they as you see them now. Yeah, thank God change has happened. Yeah, you know, in that area or that you see AEDs at like at least at many, many places way more than uh, yeah some years ago. So definitely it's a good improvement, but still, yeah. And okay, you had your cardiac arrest and what then? Like you got some diagnosis for a yeah. heart disease or what did they know? How do they know why it happened? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah. the first night I was in the hospital, um, you know, I was unconscious, but they told my parents that I most likely had some form of heart disease. Hmm. Um, and they kind of explained a few different ones to them. And then the first thing I remember when I was in the hospital was going through a bunch of tests. So, you know, uh, echocardiograms, cardiac MRIs, yep. cardiac catheterizations, all that. And I was diagnosed with a disease, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Right, right. Which yep. is, you know, relatively or more common than we would have ever thought. And again, it was just so um, surprising for um, my family and me because we never thought that, you know, me being a young, healthy guy could possibly have heart disease. You know, but we learned that it's something that you're born with and it's, you know, um, you know, hereditary condition. And um, and yeah, it just uh, it just reared its ugly head that that day. Uh, and anyone else in your family has a two then? Yeah. So my dad has it, but he didn't get diagnosed until after my cardiac arrest, which is so interesting. Whoa. Um, you know, he played basketball and baseball in college and, um, you know, it's never affected him a day in his life. Um, but he's the only one, thankfully I have a younger brother, but he, um, he gets tested, you know, once a year or so, and he, he still doesn't have the disease and he just turned 30. So he's pretty much uh, in the clear at this point. I actually had like last week ago, two girls, Bethany and Hannah, uh, yeah. who also have, oh yeah, you know them. Yeah. Yeah. I know them. Yeah. They have the same, yeah, yeah, uh, they have the same. Yeah. also when they were young, they got diagnosed and it was, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also in their family. So. Okay, wow. So not only your life, but your dad's life in a way changed slightly too, I guess, right? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Huh. And you have an ICD, I guess? Yeah. So I have uh, an ICD. Um, I actually didn't leave the hospital until um, they placed it. I've had it for 17 years. Um, it's a subcutaneous ICD now. So I used to have a transvenous ICD under my um, it just sat under my left collarbone on the front of my chest. And now I have the subcutaneous on the back left side, uh, kind of above my rib cage. Okay. So you've had your ICD replaced already. Yeah. I've had it replaced, uh, twice. Oh, twice. So, yeah. I mean, I've had mine only for like, uh, three years almost now. So I'm not there yet to get it replaced, but how is 
how is it to to have it replaced? It's it's honestly amazing how simple of a surgery it is. Um, huh? You're in and out. It's inpatient, so they didn't have me stay in the hospital. Um, they take the take the battery out and put a new one in and test it, and you're pretty much good to go. And then you know, like any surgery, like it's a little um, sore and stiff in the area where they you know make the incision, but it goes away in about a week. Yeah. Okay. That's good. that's good to know. Actually. Yeah. It's a very simple uh, procedure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank God. Wow. Uh, I mean, I've I've heard uh, I've heard of it actually that it's not so crazy to do it, but still, it's nice to hear it from someone who's who's had it done Experienced already. It. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and your recovery from when you were seventeen up until now, like like how were the few the first few years actually for you yeah it was um it was definitely challenging at first because you know one of the pieces of news was that i could no longer play basketball which was like a huge part of my life yeah. and and things have changed since then like now i think they're much more open-minded to allowing younger people to participate in sports with disease heart disease um so, but I would say like, it took me a couple years. I, I had my senior year of high school. I went to college and, you know, I, I dealt with a bunch of different things. Like I gained some weight because I was afraid to work out and I didn't really know mm. kind of how to like manage the disease and just live my life. And, um, but now I, you know, 17 years later, I have a really normal life other than, you know, I, I see a cardiologist, I see an electrophysiologist from time to time, but I'm active. I exercise. You know, nice. I don't have like day to day symptoms. So like I'm 34 years old and, and my life is, is really normal. That's awesome. That's really yeah. awesome to hear. So it was actually the first few years that were in a way the hardest then? Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like the first couple of years just trying to like, you know, being afraid of like it happening again, being afraid of my defibrillator shocking me, yeah. um, being afraid of like uh, it happening again and not my defibrillator not working the way it's supposed to like kind of things that... Um, you know, are normal that, that come with something new. But um, yeah, it, you know, I would say after those first couple of years, I kind of really figured out how to like manage the disease and, and just really live live my life as normally as possible. Have you ever had a shock from your eyes? I've never had a shock. Okay, good, yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Uh, okay, well, I'm, I'm super happy actually to hear that you're basically living life pretty close to normal then. Thank you, yeah. And... Um, medication like how just out of curiosity like do you take any medication to take yeah yeah so i've been on a beta blocker called natalol natalol yep. i guess for um ever since i left the hospital that day so 40 milligrams wow. twice a day i take one uh, dose in the morning once in the evening and it's just um again it's just something i think in the beginning it was like an adjustment because you know it made me really tired and um, but now it's just like, a, you know, part of my life. I don't even notice it. Hmm. So the tiredness you would say has reduced in a way? Yeah. I think my body's just like adjusted to it. Like I don't, I don't get like, you know, I think in the beginning because it's, you know, it's, it's controlling your blood pressure, it's lowering your heart rate. Yeah. It naturally is, is going to make you a little tired. Um, and now, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have like points in the day where I'm like exhausted or, you know, I need to take a nap or something. I just have, yeah, it's just, I don't even notice that I take the medicine. Cause for me at the moment, it's still something that I feel is affecting my energy levels, mm -hmm. um, quite a lot, the medication. So I hope maybe at some point in some years, it might also be less. What do yeah. you, what do you take if you don't mind me? Yeah, no, uh, well, They've changed uh, my medication quite a lot of times. Like I'm, I'm yeah. on something very different now, uh, just a few days. So I was on a uh, beta blocker uh, for the first year and then also on an ACE inhibitor, uh, Ramipril. And then, yeah, like I said, they changed it to so many uh, different things. Now I'm on something called kine, Kinedina, I think. Mm. I have no idea actually what it is. But yeah. It's sometimes weird because it's also being used to treat malaria, which is which is, wow. <laughs> which is like, like, yeah, uh, very strange. But well, um, so probably because of that. But um, yeah, I, I still remember for sure the first year having the same medication for a whole year was definitely making me quite tired, which was a beta blocker, uh, but hasn't mm -hmm. changed so much now, the tiredness. 
But I could see in the beginning how it uh, must be. I think for m most people that I've read who have had a cardiac arrest or survived it already for quite a lot of years, that it's the first couple of years that seem to be the hardest. Because you're figuring everything out still. Yeah, I think so. Uh, you know, I, I mean, if you survive the cardiac arrest, you've had like a near death experience in your life. Like there's no like formula for how to go through that, you know, emotionally. Um, That's true. You know, there's a point in life where a doctor comes to you and says, you didn't, you almost died. And if you didn't receive this treatment, you know, CPR, the defibrillator, you would have died. And that's a lot to take in, especially for like a young person, right? Like yeah. when you're, when you're 17 years old or, you know, in your twenties, yeah. even in your thirties, you're not really thinking about like your mortality, which is um, not something that's like comfortable to think about. So I think like, obviously there's a physical recovery that comes with it. Like, um, you know, figuring out kind of how to be healthy and active and stuff, but the emotional piece of it's really important. And, that's why, you know, you know, the idea of recovery post having cardiac arrest and, per, you know, resources for those people is so important because it's challenging. I mean, like I said, I had my own fears. I had my hesitations, things I was afraid to do. Um, and, you know, it, it takes time to get, get over that. But didn't it limit your life quite a lot when you were 17? Because that's like, you know, high school, I, like... There's so many things that uh, that you have to do in a way or, or that you need some energy for, right? I mean, when you're older, uh, of course, too. Yeah. But I could imagine it could limitate you from doing social things even sometimes. Yeah, I, I, again, it was just a weird time. Like, I, I definitely, um, like I said, I was a basketball player. So losing basketball is like a huge um, blow for me. You know, I was going to play basketball in college. Um and, you know, you kind of think when you're a kid that when you play sports, they define who you are. Um, so, like, I think I think it was just like kind of like a snowball effect. Like, I I came home from the hospital. I was super scared, you know, to I, I was afraid to exercise because I didn't want to go into cardiac arrest again. I didn't want my ICD to shock me. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I was, you know, when you're in high school, you don't really think about what you eat. <laughs> you just kind of like have like you know, whatever diet, you don't have to worry about it as much. And I continue to, you know, eat whatever I wanted, like a typical high school kid. And then that caused me to gain weight, which caused me to be self-conscious, which caused me not to want to hang out like with my friends, like I used to, or go swimming or go to the beach. And so I think, yeah, I think it was definitely like, and then I went to college and college is confusing time, yeah. <laughs> no matter what, whether you have yeah, an ICD, yeah. whatever you, so you know, then I was like trying to manage that stuff, right? Like all my friends in college are starting to go to parties and, you know, drink alcohol. And so then you're questioning like, how is this going to affect my life? Is this going to be okay? And so I just think that, you know, those are like pivotal years, no matter what. And then putting the cardiac arrest on top of it just kind of made it just a little bit more challenging, but yeah, you know, it's worked itself out. <laughs> I guess so. Right. But still, Life is definitely a bit more complicated or a lot even more complicated having having yeah. to deal with all this, right? Yeah. And how do you feel today? I mean, you said that you can do pretty much everything again, like playing basketball uh, even. Yeah, I mean, I don't... Just because when you're, when you're in your 30s, you're not, you know, like I don't play... I don't play a ton of basketball just because it's... It's, it's just not that, like, accessible anymore, right? Like, you, you kind of, like... Uh, when you're growing up, you play on teams and you have your friends and you hang out every day and play sports. But like now, I mean, I exercise every, every day, pretty much. I can go out for runs. You know, I, I'm definitely like probably cautious of how hard I'm pushing myself and yeah. I'm not pushing myself to the point where I might feel dizzy or lightheaded. And right. so I think, um, you know, like the layout, my life is super normal. Um, and, and I feel great. Like, you know, I, I, feel like I'm in good shape and, uh, you know, I'm just happy with the kind of the balance I have and the things I'm able to do. Hmm. Is there like a max amount of heartbeats that you can have that you can't go over? Um, I'm pretty sure my defibrillator is set at a number, but because of my beta blocker, I don't even get close to it. Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes I'll monitor just I'm curious what my heart rate is. So even if I'm running like really hard or something like, 
because of the beta blocker, my heart rate never really gets that high. Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been, and well, still is in many ways. To show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the heart warrior project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs and if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug. Or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. Is there actually in any other ways you feel that like your life has changed quite a lot since your cardiac arrest? Still um, to today? I think the biggest thing in like a positive way that it affected me was that, you know, it just made me open-minded to like what life is and what's important and what to, you know, get stressed about, what not to get stressed about. And like, I think... You know, when you have like a near death experience, like you almost value the the little things in life and the things you do more. Yep. So I think in a positive way that my sudden cardiac arrest has helped with that. Um, you know, I guess the the negative way is like you always think about like if it didn't happen, right? Like how different would my life be? Um, I don't. It'd be very different. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing. You know, I wouldn't. Have, probably gone to the college that I went to, I would have gone to a different college to play basketball. So it's just, it's Wait, just, uh, if, if what didn't happen, if I never had the cardiac arrest. Oh yeah. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's true. So, yeah. yeah. So, but overall, I mean, I look back on it as like, it just pushed my life in a different direction. Yeah. It did for sure. I guess. Yeah. Because you started, um, a nonprofit organization, right? Called in a heartbeat foundation. Yep. I guess that could be said is sort of a a beautiful thing that came out of this in, yeah. in you know the work that you're doing with it and the people that you're helping with that. Um, can you maybe explain to listeners what the foundation is about, what the nonprofit yeah. is about, and what you do? Definitely. So I well, I think you're 100 percent right. Like I, another positive that's come from it is it kind of gave me like my purpose in life. Like I'm super passionate about cardiac arrest and heart disease and and learning more about it and um, learning how to help people. But yeah, so we, we started in a heartbeat about um, six, seven years ago. And we, it who started, is uh, oh, just my family and I. Oh, okay. Uh, my, fa oh. my family, yeah. My That's family, cool. some friends and myself, we started the organization. And, wow. um, you know, uh, our mission was to help prevent death from sudden cardiac arrest, which is like a very broad mission. Um, and we did that on purpose because there were like a lot of different things we wanted to do. Um, first and foremost, when we first started, we, we launched our AED donation program. So um, basically what that is, is we donate automated external defibrillators to schools, businesses, families, and other organizations that need them. Cool. Um, with the donations, you know, really what our goal is to help educate people and make sure they're prepared for sudden cardiac arrest. So not only donating the AED, but... Um, assisting however we can, whether it's training, whether it's helping them set up an emergency action plan, whether mm. it's helping them create a plan for maintenance and making sure that if we donate an AED to a school, for example, that they have all the pieces in place that if a child at that school has a cardiac arrest, that child's going to have the best chance of surviving. Wow. Um, okay. So we've donated 265 AEDs. To what? Date. 
Yeah, yeah, we've donated Whoa. 265. Um, and, you know, each year we're donating a little more. Um, so it's, it's going really well. Um, Dude, that's and impressive. Other, oh, thank you. Yeah, wow. the other thing was we, uh, we launched a cardiac, um, a research um, a research funding program. So we would help support research projects that focused on heart disease. And um, we've donated $35,000 to various research projects. Um, you know, we have a small patient support program, which is, um, you know, people have reached out to us lo- looking for support, whether they're cardiac arrest survivors, heart disease patients, patients living with defibrillators and their families. And we just kind of help them just based on personal experiences, whether it's me as a patient, family, my family as like, you know, the family members of a patient and so forth. Um, and then our, our most recent program, which we're really excited about, we're trying to grow is our cardiac screening program. And that basically provides free electrocardiograms to children, teens, and young adults. Um, so basically we call it primary prevention. Uh, we know the survival rate for cardiac arrest is very low. Yeah. Um, a lot of things have to go very well for someone to survive. Mm-hmm. And we also know that young people don't typically get their hearts checked, right? I didn't get my heart checked and I have a disease that was detectable on an EKG. Mm-hmm. So this program basically provides free EKGs to young people. And we partner with doctors all over the state and um, they interpret the EKGs and assist with follow-up if needed. So, um, you know, we're, we're really proud of that program. We're really trying to grow it. We're trying to get to more schools and, uh, you know, because, you know, the two big things are preparedness with CPR and AED, but also primary prevention. Can we detect a heart True. disease before someone's in a situation where they need CPR and an AED to save their life? Yeah, that's the best thing to do first. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I'm impressed, man. That's Thank you. Thank amazing. you. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're working wow. at it. We're trying to, trying to keep growing. Yeah, I intentionally, I mean, I checked uh, the website and I looked at it briefly, but I intentionally didn't want to check too much to just yeah, sure. uh, kind of hear from you right for right now. But uh, wow, that's amazing. When did you start this? Uh, it was like the end of 2015. So we really started doing work in 2016. Okay, you had your card. Okay, yeah. How many years? Wait, how many years was that after your cardiac arrest? 2015? It was 10 years after my cardiac arrest. 10 years. Yeah. What let you to eventually do this? Well, when, when I first had the cardiac arrest, we were doing volunteer work for the American Heart Association. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, like I, I had always talked about doing it. We always kind of said we should kind of do some stuff because, you know, the American Heart Association doesn't necessarily do those specific things that we do. Mm. So. Um, but then I was in college for, you know, for four years, I had my senior high school college for four years. So that's five years right there. Then my first job out of college, I was coaching college basketball full time. So I was super, super busy with that. And then I just got to a point where I just, um, I had like a little medical minor setback in 2015 with my defibrillator. It's like a kind of, it's a weird thing that happened, but Wait, that kind of made me, me share. Uh, yeah, I will. Um, uh-huh. but that's what made me do it. So I, I will share. I just, you know, I don't, I want to just say first, I, I 100% believe in ICD. So I, I never want this story to scare people because it's a very rare thing. But when I had my first um, battery change, I just caught an infection, um, which is like a risk with any surgery, oh. right? If they're going to open up your body, there's a chance that an infection gets in. Um, and then what it led to was it led to a lead extraction. And lead extractions come with certain risks. Um, and one of the risks is that your heart could start bleeding in the surgery. And, it, you know, you could bleed out. Um, but what they do is they prepare you for open heart surgery. So if your heart starts to bleed, they have to do emergency open heart surgery to save your life. So that all happened to me. Um, really? And I think that was like the point where I like was like, you know what, let's stop talking about this. Let's do it. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that motivated you to do this, of course. Yeah. But, um, so you had an open heart surgery. Yep. I have a, I have a zipper. <laughs> Damn, that's heavy. Yeah. Yeah, okay. But uh, like you said, this should, would normally not happen to, to most people. Yeah. A lot it's, of it's bad su- luck. Super rare. It's like a less than 1% chance of it happening. 
Uh, did you had some other complications after that? Like, did it take a while to heal? Uh, open heart surgery definitely was more of a recovery than just having the ICD placed. Just because, you know, you, you know, your ribs are broken, so you, you have to wait for them to heal because they, they cut them. Um, they, or they, they have to crack your chest open. Oh, and they then, have to do that. Yeah, so they have to, you know, saw your chest open to open up the rib cage to access yeah, the heart. Yeah, yeah. Wow. And um, so they, you have to wait for them to heal. And then, like, you know, when you're having open heart surgery or any major surgery, you have blood transfusions. Yeah. So, yeah, I was just, uh, like, worn out after for a bit. Like, I'd get tired really quickly. Um, like, I would, you know, I, when I got home after few weeks in the hospital like I would you know total opposite of like what I was saying before but like I would I would just do a very basic task like walk outside to I don't know get something at the front door and I'd be like really tired or I my parents would like take me to watch like a basketball game or something and I'd come home and fall asleep for like five hours so it definitely took time to recover from the open heart surgery how long did it take? Um, Hard to say, yeah, maybe, but like, yeah, six weeks. I was pretty much just like home, hanging out for maybe less than that, four weeks, and then, um, and I had no defibrillator in at this point. They had to like take the defibrillator out, flush out the infection. So I was wearing one of those uh, life vests. Wait, what? Life vests? Yeah, basically, it's an external device that you can wear. Um, it can serve, it serves the purpose of a defibrillator. And it's just basically what someone wears while they're waiting to see if they're going to get a defibrillator or not. Wait, what? You had to wear that for how long? I had to wear it for like six weeks. Six weeks? Yeah. So the whole time? Yeah, you know, you never take it off unless you take a shower. <laughs> what? Yeah, and then, and then because basically they wanted to wait to put the new defibrillator in. Yeah. Um, and then as soon as they put the new defibrillator in, defibrillator and i didn't have to wear it obviously yeah sure sure <laughs> okay yeah. what so, yeah yeah that's like part two of my story <laughs> do you never feel um i don't know angry or something about all that has happened to you uh no no never anger um or some other you know yeah in, emotion I don't know. I, or... yeah never anger i think i have like it's kind of taken the feeling of like, I feel like it happened to me and I was like strong enough to handle it and it's okay. Um, but no, I don't, I don't feel anger, which is, it's a good question. Um, you know, when that whole thing happened, I was definitely frustrated. Like I was like, yeah, or frustrated. Or something yeah. Like I was like this, you know, this was kind of like a free thing that didn't need to happen. Like what, why, why, why am I going through this? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I definitely had, that different feelings at the time but looking back i really don't have any negative feelings towards this kind of just uh, something that happens oh wait you said that it was part two of your story what is part three if there's a part three <laughs> there's no part three uh, <laughs> okay um yeah there's just a part one and a part two hopefully <laughs> no more parts yeah <laughs> yeah or, or, or just positive parts maybe yeah, right? positive part. yeah exactly <laughs> yeah uh, and, uh, you also have a podcast, right? A Big Heart? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so the podcast is, um, yeah, it's called A Big Heart. And, um, really the goal of it is, uh, again, just similar to what you're doing, right? Is to help heart disease patients and cardiac arrest survivors and people living with ICDs and, and, um, allow them to hear from other people that are going through similar things, right? Like, we all have our doctors who are brilliant and they help keep us safe and I'm very thankful for them. But I think a huge part of the treatment process is also like talking to somebody else or hearing from someone else that's gone through oh, yeah. what you're going through. You know, your doctor hasn't um, for in the most part, some doctors maybe have, but um, you know, and, and again, they're great and they're the most important part of your treatment, but it's also important to kind of learn from somebody else that's gone through something similar. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mm -hmm. so, so you also felt a little bit somewhere, well, what's, yeah, maybe a, a lack of support somewhere? Um, I think like early on, it was more like as I got older, like when I hit my mid 20s, I kind of thought like, wow, like it would have been helpful for me to talk to a younger person that was going through something similar. 
And I just sure. never really did. And that's kind of where the passion for a lot of this stuff came was like, well, now I'm eight years past cardiac arrest. Um, I can help other people that are going through this. I have eight years of experience, you know, mm -hmm. living with yeah. heart disease. So I can be one of those resources for people. Well, I'm glad that you started all this. Uh, we can only Thank use you. more platforms and, and, you know, nonprofits and all these things uh, like what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's Definitely. really likewise, it's really I, you cool. know, what you're doing with the podcast is it's huge for people, you know, and hmm. people don't realize it, but it's just a huge resource for people it's just even yeah, to yeah. hear that there's other people going through similar situations is, is really important. I can imagine that you received a lot of thank you notes or a lot of uh, just messages from people appreciating what you do uh, and, you know, who also survived the cardiac arrest and that they feel a bit less alone in it or something. Yeah, people reach out from time to time, which is great. And, and that's the goal, right? If you can impact or positively impact one person, yeah. you know, what, what, what's Yeah, that's true. That? Yeah. That's, that's a good start already. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> you also wrote a book, right? Yeah, um, yeah. When did Called you write that? Called Big Heart as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, exactly. That was actually the website that I was looking at. Uh, when, when did you wrote the book? Uh, so I published the book in September of 2021. So it's been about two years. Um, and again, similar to the podcast, it, it really was designed to help people um, that are going through this stuff that we're going through. Um, and then also, I think there's like an inspirational piece to it. It's like, it's not like the only audience is like a heart disease patient. Um, but certainly as I was writing it, You know, that was my goal was to help heart disease mm. patients. How long did, did it take you to write the book? It took me a while. I, it was like a thing I started right after college and then stopped and started again. And then I think over COVID, right, when we all had like nothing to do besides think. And <laughs> sure, <laughs> I was like, now it's time to uh, it's time to finish this thing up. Okay. And then it happens. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. I mean, for everyone listening, I will uh, link up, I mean, the nonprofit, uh, the podcast and the book in the show notes. Um, it's cool that you do all this. It's cool that you wrote the book, too. Has it been helpful in a way for you or self as well? Writing yeah, I think so. I think it was definitely this. like ther therapeutic to write it. And um, yeah. it also gave me the opportunity to like reconnect with old people, old friends, old doctors. You know, right, because I, I used, you know, my original doctors um, that diagnosed me, my first doctor that I put in my ICD, I don't see them anymore. So it gave mm. me a chance to kind of reconnect with them and, and send them a copy and make sure they were comfortable with, you know, how I used their name and, you know, set up a Zoom with, with them. And, you know, like uh, my first doctor that put my ICD in, you know, I hadn't seen them in I had a Zoom with them probably right before I published the book show about two years ago. So it had been like 15 years. So it's really cool wow. to be able to reconnect with those people. Wait, what? Like that's how, how was it then to connect with, with that person after so oh, many years? It's awesome, you know, and, and, you know, you meet these people. He had such a profound impact on my life and on my family's life. So it's like, oh, it was, it was really cool. Cool. I mean, yeah. sounds like a very cool project actually to do to, you know, writing that book. Yeah. You got to do it now. You, would, huh? <laughs> you yeah. got to do it now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. Don't have much inspiration right now to do it. But uh, yeah. I, I guess, like you said, it can be quite healing in a lot of ways yeah. too. Oh, no Even doubt. if it's like a short article or something or something yeah. for yourself, right? Um, I think it can be very healing to write about all that has happened to you. Definitely. Mm. And so it's a book for other cardiac arrest survivors, you said, but not per se. It could also like... Um, yeah. inspires some other people who are going through something then. Yeah, I think I think really for anyone that's looking for some inspiration, but of course if there's a direct quarrel, if you're a if you're a heart disease right. patient, um you know, I think there's that's you know, that's the um the person that's gonna help. Is there actually anything, you know, um after so many years now, uh Anything that you wished your cardiologist would have told you sooner? Or, you know, something you wished you discovered sooner about having a cardiac arrest or uh, or living with an ICD? 
Yeah, I'll tell you this. So I would say, what year was this? I would say maybe 10 years after my cardiac arrest, I was speaking at a conference um, to doctors about my story. And um, what they had asked me to do was they asked me to present some of the challenges that I had as a, um, as a patient uh, growing up uh, after my cardiac arrest, where exactly what your question was, uh, you know, how could move my care have been better? And one of the big things was that I was afraid to go to sleep because I was afraid I was going to die in my sleep. So I told this whole story and um, an electrophysiologist uh, who puts in ICDs uh, stood up afterwards and she said, it's very interesting that you said you were afraid to sleep um, after you got your ICD and went home because as a doctor, when I put in an ICD in a patient, I sleep better because now I know they're safe. And I don't know, that <laughs> wow. like one statement like really put things in perspective for me. Um, it was just a really cool like moment and like eye-opening moment for me that I'll never forget. And I was like, wow, like these doctors are the experts in this disease and they are so confident in these devices. So, um, yeah, that's definitely one that, uh, I don't know if it really answers your question, Greg, but it's just something that like, I wish maybe I heard that, uh, you know, yeah, yeah. eight years prior. <laughs> I love it. Thank you for yeah. sharing that actually, because yeah. that fear of going to bed, because I had my cardiac arrest when I was asleep. Yeah. So I feel like I do more now think about going to sleep because I'm like, is it going to happen again? I don't think yeah. about it all the time, right? But yeah, but that's the what tendency the, is yeah. more there now than in the past. Definitely. But it, it just helps me like I'm so confident with my defibrillator now that like, but it's it was amazing to hear like a doctor saying it and being, you know, that's, that's, they're, they're confident. Yeah. I think it's really beautiful what she shared, actually. I mean, yeah. to me, actually, this does it's helpful. feel... <laughs> Yeah, it does feel helpful. Yeah. Okay. Wow, thanks for sharing. That's good. Yeah. Is there anything, you know, that you do that you could, like, share to anyone listening who is a survivor? Uh, anything that you do when you feel, like, bad uh, or tired or, like, just frustrated uh, to, uh, to everything that has happened to you? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, great question. I think one of the healthiest things to do, <laughs> this will make me sound old maybe, is uh, <laughs> is just to go for like a nice walk. Um, so like, yeah, of course I have points in my life where I get, you know, stressed and I have other things going on and I'm like, you know, I get overwhelmed by things. But I think like a great way to like clear your head is just to be outside and get fresh air and go for like a nice walk. And like, I don't know, it helps, it helps us like, clear clear your mind and kind of just reset you a little bit um you know the other thing is i think it's like really important to like you know express any sort of those feelings you have with your doctor right because their job is to yeah. try to help you and they're excuse yeah. me their job is to try to help you live this like normal life and um you should be comfortable going to them and and if you're not you know you need to kind of like evaluate that situation yeah. but you need to be comfortable going to your doctor and expressing how you feel. And, and, and I think they want you to do that because they want to help you kind of live this quote unquote normal life that you're capable of living. I agree. Yeah. Have you actually switched uh, cardiologists through the years? Like often? Uh, no, you know, the only time I switched was because, you know, when I had my cardiac arrest, I was 17. So I was considered a pediatric. Um, so my pediatric cardiologist who diagnosed me and everything, she saw me through college and then, you know, just, she, you know, she could only see you up to a certain age because she deals with pediatrics. And um, so I've had the same cardiologist. My electrophysiologist has changed a couple of times just because they've gotten different jobs. Um, okay. So, you know, they've gone to different hospitals that aren't, you know, close to me. Yeah. But the ones, the one that you're working with now, you feel a good connection with. Oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah I would say that's also quite key, right? Because you do have some people who don't feel like they're being hurt by their car cardiologists. Definitely. It's which, really important to feel Yeah, hurt. yeah. Because yeah. like you said, you got to be able or f you got to feel comfortable sharing all those things. If your yeah. life is not feeling good right now because of the side effects from your medication or, or, or whatever, you should, be, you should be feeling comfortable to share that. 
yep. with your cardiologist. I think that's uh, important. Is there actually still something, you know, after all these years now, um, that you still feel is quite difficult to communicate with people around you? I'm pretty open to talking about and answering questions and explaining my disease and experiences with anybody. Mm -hmm. I would say the most frustrating thing for me, 17 years after, and this isn't necessarily directly related to my health, but is there still such a lack of people understanding that young people are affected by cardiac arrest and heart disease. And that's very frustrating to me because we're starting to see it with very prominent athletes in the US. Yeah. Um, and I mean, in, in, in the UK, right? With Christian Erickson a few years ago. Um, like we just, as a society, I think we need to do a better job, like um, understanding heart disease, making sure we're prepared because we're losing too many young people to sudden cardiac arrest. And it's really, really sad. Yeah, that's the frustrating part about it for you, that it's not being taken so, in a way, seriously. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's getting there, right? Because, you know, we had an incident in January with uh, Damar Hamlin, who is an NFL player. Yeah, yeah. And then, Le again, LeBron James' kid on Monday. So I think people are starting to be more serious about it, but, um, I mean, still, young people are dying. So, like, Taking it more seriously would mean like more legislation, right? More laws mandating AEDs, screening yeah, yeah. young kids' hearts, and we're just not there yet, which is frustrating. I agree. Yeah, it's sad in a way that only once someone had a cardiac arrest and it's someone quite famous, and it's like yeah. in the media that we're all of a sudden talking about it, even though so many people have died from this. Uh, and that, exactly that. It's frustrating because one of two things happens. Um, right to your point, yes, all of a sudden now, all these families have been affected by sudden cardiac arrest and for them, parents that have lost kids, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, now they're, it's frustrating right now it's being taken seriously because it happened to someone famous, but I mean, along with that, it's creating a lot of good awareness. Um, that's but right, that's the right. other, the other side of it is a lot of times like people wait till something happens before they act upon it. Right. Instead of being proactive they're reactive right somebody has to die or somebody has to almost die and then oh what we need to have a, a defibrillator we need to train yep. our employees which is frustrating but that's in a way how how it often goes right <laughs> no, it's how, yeah, a lot of things works. first yeah yeah a lot of things have to go wrong first before we're like oh wait maybe we should um put more awareness on this or do more things around this it's yeah. like you said it's a bit out of work works but it's frustrating Yeah. yeah. Mike, I just have um, one more question for you. Cool. And uh, that is, uh, what is like a best last tip that you would share to any survivor listening? Or is there anything that you would still like to let a survivor know who yeah. maybe just recently went through all this? Yeah, um, be patient. It's not going to happen overnight. But, you know, listen to your doctor and be patient. And eventually, I know it's probably hard to understand in the beginning, but you're going to go back to having a maybe relatively normal life, right? You might have some uh, exceptions where there's things your doctor doesn't want you to do, but you can have a really normal life with heart disease. It's really important to me. And I think, um, I think you just have to be patient and, and just know that it's going to happen. Connect with as many people as possible, ask questions, advocate for your health, and just listen to your doctor. Um, that, that, that's probably the big piece of advice that I would give. Mm -hmm. Good piece of advice. Yeah. One more thing, just, uh, curious now to know, like your heart disease has, how, how is it? Like, is, has it, is it the same from when you were Great 17? Question. Has it gotten yeah. worse? So thankfully it has not progressed. And okay. that can't happen with HCM patients. There's kind of two sides to it. There's HCM and then there's H. O C M. So there's people that have obstruction. Ah. I do not have obstruction, which is good. Um, you know, for, for me and, um, you know, people that have obstruction tend to have a more severe case of like symptoms and, you know, there's HCM patients, unfortunately, that end up going into heart failure and need a transplant. Um, but thankfully yeah. my thickening of my heart has not changed at all. And, um, yeah. you know, it doesn't seem like I'm on that track right now. Okay, I'm uh, I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, Mike, thank you. And I'm so grateful just for all the work that you're doing. Keep doing it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, keep doing it. Thanks for having me on. And thanks for, um, you know, the time that you're putting into this podcast. I, I think um, you kind of get in the flow of doing it. But, you know, it's a, such a valuable resource. And, you know, we, yeah. you know I, as, a, as another survivor, I, I truly appreciate the work that you're doing as well. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate so. that. And that concludes this episode with Mike Papali. I um, I do hope that you find found this episode to be helpful, um, that you found some support and value in it. If you want to find any of the resources mentioned, such as uh, the foundation that Mike founded in a heartbeat, or the podcast, A Big Heart, or his book, then do check out the show notes located in the description of this episode or by going directly to heartwarriorproject.com and search for Mike. With that, maybe I get to welcome you again on another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. This is your host, Yelis Vaz, signing off. Before you go, i uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior project which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.